My name is Karen Singer, and I'm really thrilled to welcome you all here today um, to our A-List program. Uh, the A-List series presents noted Canadian writers and titles, and today we welcome the editors and contributors to some of, just a very few of the editors and contributors to the very recently published book, The Ward, The Life and Loss of Toronto's First Immigrant Neighborhood. This is the story of the growth and destruction of Canada's first priority neighborhood which just so happens to have been located right here on this site where we are today. So it's really local, local history for us. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the Canada Council for their support for this program and all of Toronto Public Library's A-List series. And thanks to Morgan from U of T Booksellers who is here. Um, the book is available for purchase and I'm hoping you can get it autographed. Um, and there will be an opportunity to ask questions. So I'd like to introduce our panel today. In alphabetical order, we'll start with Arlene Chan. Arlene Chan is a third generation Chinese Canadian raised in Toronto's Chinatown. She has penned seven books about the history, culture, and traditions of the Chinese in Canada. She's also one of the contributors to the ward. And when she's not researching, writing, or leading tours of Chinatown, she can be found paddling around Lake Ontario on a dragon boat. <laughs> and although it wasn't included in her official biography, I must tell you, Arlene worked for Toronto Public Library for many years and was once my boss. <laughs> <laughs> so she has to stay nice. <laughs> and on my right, your left, is John Loring. John is an award-winning journalist who's contributed to many publications. Toronto Life, The Globe and Mail, Saturday Night, Quill and Choir, just among, among many. He's written extensively on amalgamation, education, urban sprawl, and other city issues. He is the recipient of two national magazine awards for his coverage of urban affairs. His first book, Opportunity Knox, The Truth About Canada's Franchise Industry, was shortlisted for the National Book Award, National Business Book Award, excuse me, and he lives here in Toronto. And our next, um, I'll stick with alphabetical, and um, editor Dr. Ellen Scheinberg is coming in, yay! Um, I'll, I'll talk while she walks. Ellen is the president of Heritage Professionals, a heritage consulting group company in Toronto that delivers archival, museum, and information management services. She holds a PhD in history from the University of Ottawa and has worked as a heritage specialist and manager for the past 25 years. Ellen has published many articles in the areas of archival studies, women's history, labor history, Canadian Jewish studies, and immigration history. She was a recipient of the Ontario Historical Society Scadding Award for Excellence and the Alexander Fraser Award. She's currently in the process of completing a coffee table book that examines the history of Toronto's Jewish community. And last but not least, we welcome editor Tatum Taylor. She's a writer and heritage specialist at ERA Architects. She holds a master's degree in historic preservation from Columbia University, where she worked on the editorial team for the Future Anterior Journal. She's actively involved with ICOMOS. I wondered about that. And the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario's Executive Committee. Her interests include the interpretation of under documented community histories and the connections between place, memory, and language. So, welcome everyone. To, uh, welcome the contributors to the ward. Thank you. Thank you for uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, it's a great crowd, and uh, uh, I think ordinarily we would say welcome to City Hall, but we're going to say welcome to the ward. Uh, before I proceed, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of the uh, contributors to the book. That if you could stand, Pat Rosebank, uh, wrote a fantastic uh, piece about. It's a murder mystery story, which I said I'm not going to give any more away. But Kelsey's it's really story, it Kelsey's happened story. just out there. Yeah. <laughs> and Lee Chenier, who's back there, who has a really interesting story. 
very briefly set up what the rest of the speakers are going to talk about. And uh, I'd like you to do a little time traveling with me. So um, you can close your eyes or not if you'd like. Uh, but I want, uh, I want us to go back 100 years to this spot where we, we're sitting now and uh, try to kind of travel back to what you would have seen if you'd been here 100 years ago. So um, we would have been in a back alley in all likelihood. Um, uh, between Tirali Street, which is Bay Street, and Elizabeth Street, which is run sort of roughly um, along the west wall of, the, of City Hall. Um, this spot would have been in the shadow of a great big new building called uh, Chase Hippodrome. Sorry? Is it two? Oh, sorry. Um, is this okay? All right. Oh, that's good. So, Shea's Hippodrome would, would have been right here on this corner. It's a 3,200-seat uh, vaudeville theater. Of course, the uh, uh, then new city hall would have been sort of moving over the area. Along that entire stretch of Tirali was a kind of a wall of brick, very imposing, fortress-like uh, uh, warehouses that belonged to Eaton, and they were factories. Um, over here, there were lots of very small kind of tumble-down cottages and stores. Would it look something like uh, Kensington Market? Um, and if you'd walked in, in this backyard that we were in, um, there there would have been some shacks, uh, some uh, lots of outdoor toilets, pretties as they were known, uh, a water spout, uh, some pretty crowded, pretty derelict housing. So we walk that way through the alleyway, get to Elizabeth Street. On well, Elizabeth Street, you have um, you have some. Chinese uh, laundries and cafes, you have some uh, Jewish bakeries and butcher shops. And if you walk, if you turned and walked north, you would, um, you would walk along what was a kind of a main street and you would pass some buildings that had some significance in the area. Um, a little bit further north, uh, you would come to a brand new apartment building which is called the Weinberg Apartments, which is still there in fact. Um, at the corner of Elizabeth and, uh, and Dundas. It was seen to be sort of a model of new, a new type of housing. Some people were suspicious of it and thought it was the beginning of a kind of a tenement style housing in Toronto. You walked a little bit further north from that, you came to this yellow brick building, uh, which yellow brick in those days was meant to denote uh, sort of something of institutional significance, and it was the poor house or the house of industry where uh, welfare recipients had to go and, and sort of uh, balance great for food and shelter and uh, break stones in order to, to receive their, their assistance. Uh, we're about equidistant from two significant churches that were both opened by African American uh, slaves and free men who came up through the Underground Railroad and you know built a community in this area. Uh, one of them was just over at Chestnut Street across from where the U of T residence is. Another is where the H. Fremont Bay stands and by a hundred years ago, today it was owned by a group that ran, used it as a Yiddish language theater. As we go further up Elizabeth Street, we pass, uh, we pass a playground, the Elizabeth Street Playground, freshly opened, it was only about three years old, a hundred years ago, uh, had all sorts of playground equipment, and it was kind of a novel thing, because in Toronto in those days, there were no playgrounds, there were no supervised playgrounds, for sure, and none with equipment. And it was it was all about uh, uh, you know it was all about creating sort of uh, you, you know a, a sort of productive constructive activities for young people because there was a lot of concern about you know delinquency and kids wandering the streets. So as you continued your trip, you might have passed some some guys with carts with you know full of dry goods. These were peddlers. Uh, lots of activity on the streets a hundred years ago. This area had about eighteen thousand people living in it. So from from uh, Queen to College, uh, Young to University, so it was, it was dense. It was the same kind of density as the as downtown Paris is today. Um, you would have seen a school, the Hester Howe Public School. Um, I noticed on the way in that there's the Hester Howe Daycare Center, which is just tucked in at the back near the uh, press gallery, and it's the same Hester Howe. Um, and finally, you would have you would have come, you would have been reaching College Street. You would see the new uh, Toronto General Hospital complex, which had kind of occupied a big uh, corner of, of the northeast, the northwest part of the ward. Uh, so this was a dense area. There was, there was poverty, there was ambition, there was all sorts of, you know, there were you know, people from all sorts of uh, ethnocultural groups, there were different religious organizations and institutions. 
Uh, and it was a, it was a vibrant, uh, not rich, but uh, very diverse community. And within a few decades, it disappeared. And we're going to talk about why it disappeared. And, uh, my collaborators on this project are going to go into more of that detail. Uh, and you know, this, one of the reasons that we, we did this book is to kind of explore why it disappeared, why it's significant, why is this area meaningful to Toronto in 2015. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Tatum Taylor, who's going to talk a little bit about the, the way the city talked about and thought about the people who lived in this area, who were very different than the rest of Torontonians at that time. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? No. No. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Hold it up. Hold it up. Okay. Good afternoon, and thanks again for joining us. Um, as John explained, our goal with this book was to provide a multifaceted and inclusive account of a part of the city that for a long time was neglected from Toronto's traditional history. We collected archival materials and a wide variety of voices and perspectives in order to try to explore the complexities of the ward and the people who lived there. So after I speak, Ellen and Arlene are going to share some of the details of how the ward's communities functioned. But before we get there, I'd like to set up a bit of a contrast by giving you an overview of how the mainstream media portrayed the ward during the first half of the 20th century. Sure. <laughs> Better? Um, in the same way that we look at maps and photographs and paintings to see how the ward was depicted in the past, we can learn a lot from newspapers about how the story of the ward was narrated through time. Journalists play a really important role in creating history, and I'm not just saying that to flatter the guy next to me. <laughs> they have a really powerful capacity to both affect and reflect public perception, and they produce a lasting record of thoughts and opinions. As a heritage planner, my inclination when I'm trying to uncover the history of a place or an event is to first find out how the story was told in its own time. A really great place to start is by trawling through the library's collection of archival newspapers. And this is especially useful for a place like the Ward, which was not exactly a popular destination for people who lived in other areas of Toronto. So newspapers had an even more potential to color the images that people had in their minds of what the ward was like. The ward received quite a bit of media coverage throughout its history, and a lot of this coverage might make us more than a little uncomfortable today. And it should, because it shows a side of Toronto's past that contradicts the way we like to talk about Toronto today as an inclusive and harmonious and diverse city and all of those characteristics that, that we love about it. In 2002, the Toronto Star published an article about the ward that uh, said the turn of the last century was, quote, an age of petty-mindedness and prudery. And articles from over 100 years ago suggest that that might be a fair description, while also encouraging us to consider how much things have really changed since then. Journalists in the early 20th century usually took one of two general approaches to writing about the ward, both of which served the purpose of showing readers just how different the ward's residents were from the clean and hardworking and respectable and mostly white Torontonians who lived elsewhere. A first journalistic approach warned of an invasion of foreigners or a large number of these undesirables. These are direct quotes, by the way. One journalist actually went door to door along a street in the ward, pretending to be a missionary at Christmas time, just so that he could get inside some of these houses and write an expose about how dirty and unrespectable they were. A Globe and Mail article in 1922 said, Jewish immigrants, Italians, Russians, and Negroes crowd into shacks which would be condemned by modern farmers as pigsties. Human derelicts find shelter here in garrets and collars, and some of the dregs of Europe have taken up their abode in this locality, while any casual observer 
will find that parts of the slum district are tainted with moral leprosy. Another journalist the following year wrote, walking through the ward any evening, it is the sordidness of the place that strikes the eye of the casual observer first. There is the constant stir of the swarming crowds of people and the unceasing activity of swarthy, smudgy-faced children everywhere you turn. It's interesting that both of the passages that I just read make reference to the casual observer. It's as if the writers are, are saying, well, it's not just me who is alarmed by the immigrant slums. I'm not unfairly biased towards immigrants. Any casual observer would feel the same way. I would argue that there weren't actually a lot of casual observers of the ward. The ward did receive a lot of attention from outsiders, but people who came to observe the ward usually had a motive other than to take a casual leisurely stroll through the neighborhood. Most of the people who visited were either writers and artists who came to be inspired by the ward sites, or missionaries and nurses and civic officials who came to provide their services and to address what they viewed as moral or sanitary deficiencies, or just ordinary citizens who came to visit the ward's burlesque theaters and eat exotic foreign foods. This brings me to a second tactic that mainstream journalists used in the early 20th century to discuss the ward. They didn't describe it in negative terms as a threat to the city. Instead, they described it in ways that exoticized and romanticized the ward's communities and their ways of life. Instead of the, the generalizations of the first journalistic approach I described, the second used carefully chosen little details that exaggerated just how different the ward's immigrants were. For example, a writer in 1907 cast this image of the ward. The little rough cast houses in Center Avenue, Trolley and Elizabeth Streets, from which three or four years ago the Irish wash lady wended her way to us on Monday mornings, where the Italian fruit vendor ripened his bananas under the beds at night, and the Negro plasterer and barber gave color to the social scene of a summer's evening have in these later days thrown their shelter over the oppressed Slavic Jew. Practically the whole ward is a city ghetto. Another journalist wrote, a little later in the year, when sleep in crowded rooms seems all but impossible, the people of the ward are astir till all hours, and the Italians amuse themselves by singing in their rich, sweet voices the songs of their faraway homeland or dancing their dances to the music of a mandolin or a guitar in the open roadway beneath the stars. So that is a very different portrayal of the ward from the articles that I previously described. The second approach seems to have been a way for the writers and their readers to try to figure out what exactly was going on in the ward. They saw how closely knit the ward's immigrant communities were and it may, maybe made them a bit nervous and, and feel excluded. This is a different angle or interpretation of how the media and the public view the ward. And every angle we find gives a broader view of the story. By the time the city was planning the demolition and expropriation and redevelopment of the ward at mid-century, media coverage had evolved in a different direction. After World War II, immigrant displacement was a more widespread and perhaps better understood phenomenon. And now that the ward had the sense of an expiration date, Torontonians maybe felt a bit more comfortable talking about it and less threatened by the ward and its residents. Journalists wrote about the ward in a way that was frankly still racist, but less overtly anxious than in the past. Now when they romanticized the ward and talked about its strange sights and foods and sounds, there was a sense that they were a little bit nostalgic about this place that was about to be lost. They maybe found it a little bit charming. Not so charming that it didn't deserve to be demolished, but still charming. The Toronto Star in 1955 said, the neon lights are going out in the town where nobody hurries, where you can take your pick of two mares and five kinds of chop suey, and buy a package of dragon's teeth for whatever ails you. The Globe and Mail in 1957 
offered this inspired metaphor for the expropriation. In the Chinese gambling game of Fantan, it said, the operator removes buttons four at a time from a pile on the table. The remaining buttons, under four, determine the winners. In Toronto, the city is playing the role of operator and is removing entire blocks of Chinatown for a civic square. Bowing to the inevitable with typical oriental calm, it said, most members of Toronto's Chinese community have accepted the absorption of the greater part of Chinatown in the name of progress. I'll read you a final passage from 1956, which was written for the Globe and Mail by an artist named Reginald Capel, who had painted a number of images of the ward during its heyday. He said, the early 20s saw Toronto's ward district as a huge cosmopolitan hive of all nationalities. And many of us will remember the quaint old dwellings that housed them. Many of patched stucco, shuttered, and painted gaily in an attempt to keep up an air of respectability. Little of that old ward remains today. The memory of this quaint place, again, sounds very different from the way the ward was being described in the actual early 20s. This is a good example of how perceptions can shift and memories can evolve. And eventually, for the most part, people forgot to talk about the war after it was gone. The piece that I wrote on this topic for the book is called Storytelling is a Part of the Story. And I think that an important part of the story of any community is how that story got told and then passed down, both inside and outside of the community. I think this is especially important for marginalized communities, like the war's immigrants. Looking at the stories that were told to the general public, such as through the newspapers, can be a really useful way to try to trace how the ward's place in public memory evolved. We're not here to pass judgment on the writers that I quoted from or on the newspapers who published these articles. We just have to understand that these articles were a product of their times and of the societies that they were written, from, written for. And in combination with documentation and first-hand accounts and, and family memories, all of this material can help us to understand and restore and hopefully conserve the ward's place in the city's memory. So now I'll pass it over to Ellen, who will add another dimension of the ward's story by talking about what we actually know uh, of what immigrant, was, immigrant life was actually like in these communities. So I thought I'd use my time because my background is in immigration history and also archival work, uh, trying to talk about sort of two facets of the project. The first one is, how do you get away from looking at immigrants from the perspective of the dominant society? So Tatum discussed if you look at newspapers and if you rely on traditional sources like some of the reports that came out by reformers like Charles Hastings, then you get a portrayal of an immigrant according to their perception of what they were like, either exotic or, um, or you know, uh, very uncivilized. So we wanted to include traditional uh, interpretations, but also look at what was life like for the immigrants themselves, relying on different types of sources, and trying to examine all facets, or as many facets of immigrant life as we could. Um, so, rather than just relying on newspapers and uh, some of these reports, uh, and just relying on photographs uh, as illustrations, uh, we also tapped into new sources. So, uh, we used city directories and census reports. Uh, there were also oral histories and unpublished memoirs. Uh, we also had some contributions by individuals who uh, recounted stories that were passed down from generation to generation that were quite priceless. So it's really an amalgam of all those elements to try to juxtapose, juxtapose uh, the immigrants' perception of their own lives against those of depictions by journalists and reformers. Um, so one of the key things we really wanted to get at was this was a very vibrant community. Um, and immigrant life 
uh, for all the groups consisted of so many different elements beyond just the synagogue and the church. You've got mutual benefit societies, you've got social events, um, and uh, there's so many different institutions that they built and uh, activities and uh, also their own restaurants and stores and street life. So we wanted to explore all of those different aspects of immigrant life. And another thing we wanted to include was rather than looking at each group in isolation, which didn't seem realistic to us, because in the neighborhood, people live next to each other. They socialize, and even though they're from different backgrounds and they may speak different languages, you know, they work together, they live together, they play together. So we wanted to capture that kind of environment in the book. And so we look at the intersecting lives of the immigrant groups in a variety of ways, uh, through the schools, through work. Uh, there's a piece on Eaton's and there's a piece on peddlers, and so you get, and, and newspaper boys, so you get different aspects of work, and uh, Chinese cafes, and, uh, and laundries, um, but also in more unusual places. So I thought I'd look at four of the different areas where their lives intersected in unique ways. So the first one is watering holes. Um, we capture an era during prohibition, so one place that a number of the residents socialized was in saloons, speakeasies, and through bootlegging operations. And you might think that there were only a few bootleggers in the area, but actually it was very pervasive. There are a number of Jewish and Italian bootleggers, and it's hard to determine how many actually uh, were in existence at that time because they weren't going to tell the census taker. And sometimes there's an article in the book that was produced by uh, Howard Moscow about his grandmother, the bootlegger, and uh, he sent his daughter to talk to his mom about her mother and this bootlegging operation, and his mother kind of distorted the truth and said, oh, no, no, mom didn't run a bootlegging operation. We wouldn't do that. But you know, everyone in the neighborhood knew about them, and there was a certain level of tolerance as well. And it was a way to make a living, especially uh, the uh, older uh, women would use it so that they could supplement the family income, and they could actually stick around the house too if they had kids to look after. So it was uh, very convenient. And so people would come into your home, you would give them some whiskey, and you got to know your neighbors. <laughs> The second example is the bathhouse. Uh, during this time, they opened a public bath, the Harrison Baths on Stephanie Street. And there was also a Jewish Schwitz on Center Avenue. And uh, people would go, uh, usually on a weekly basis, and have their bath or their Schwitz. And they would socialize. So the one on Center Avenue was owned by Mendel Ryman, who was a peddler who was Orthodox, and initially he catered to uh, Orthodox peddlers, but then he expanded his business, and his clients included Italians and Finns, and he even had uh, a black boxing champion who became sort of the Canadian heavyweight champ, and he went off to Europe. His name was Larry Gaines, and he became a champion in the UK. And uh, they had, uh, Book, bookies, and there were all sorts of individuals who would go there to uh, relax and uh, to uh, cleanse themselves and, and chat. They would have a little deli meat, they'd have some schnapps, and it was very, very cordial and, and lovely. Um, the next one uh, is uh, the brothels. And uh, so, there was actually a thriving prostitution uh, industry in the ward, and we didn't know too much about it when we started, but we were very intent on finding out more. And we're lucky that one of our authors uh, covered off this topic and uh, identified some of the hotels and saloons like the Rex and the Ford that catered to prostitution and rented out rooms by the hour. Also, the boarding houses were, were also catering to uh, this type of trade. And what was interesting is that a lot of the prostitutes were white, and the men in the ward who were looking for prostitutes were generally single or had uh, wives overseas. 
And you have a lot of um, sojourners, you have Italian, Macedonian, but primarily Chinese clients. Uh, because of the head tax, uh, the Chinese community was a mostly bachelor society. And so there was a certain um, relationship between uh, the prostitutes and uh, the Chinese uh, men. And some of them, uh, Elise argues, developed into long-term relationships. And the last one is the outhouse. So <laughs> in, in the uh, medical report by Charles Hastings, he goes on ad nauseum about these privies. Uh, there were so many homes that had to share these outhouses, and they were viewed as an abomination. But actually, I mean, he never looked at it as the opportunity to meet new people and socialize. <laughs> so you would have 10 houses or so sharing an outhouse, and I was going through oral histories at the Multicultural History Society of Ontario and at the Ontario Jewish Archives, and one of them was lovely. It was this woman, Sarah Foster, who grew up in the ward around 1900, and she had a brush with fame at the outhouse. She shared a privy, with Mary Pickford. <laughs> and she, it was very rare because Mary Pickford was homeschooled before she went off to Hollywood. And so there were rare opportunities to meet her. So, you know, this Sarah Foster really cherished this memory of, uh, of meeting up with her at the outhouse. So as you could see, it was really important for us to cover off these kind of relationships and interactions between the residents, so you get the full picture of what life was like in the ward. Thank you. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> I'm going to be talking, I won't be outhouses and uh, brothels, uh, but I'm going to be talking about the development of Toronto's first Chinatown. And it has very humble beginnings. In 1878 was our first Chinese person uh, who was uh, named in the city directory. And he lived, he had a business, a laundry business. His name was Sam Ching on Adelaide Street East. And so from there, we started seeing more Chinese coming into Toronto from British Columbia and also from the United States. So what we saw were first the Chinese laundry. So Sam Ching started things off. And by the early 1900s, as the Jewish community was moving out and as the uh, Italian community moved to Little Italy, the Chinese started moving in in, in in the early 1900s. But there was a word that kept coming up all the time, all through the, the development of, of, of early Chinatown, and that was the dreaded D word, which is development. Because the first cluster after Sam Ching in 1878, the first cluster was around on and around York Street, but development forced them to move up to Queen Street and then develop again, force them to move up Elizabeth Street towards Dundas Street into what we now call Chinatown. So by the early 1900s, about half of the Chinese living in the city were involved somehow with restaurant, uh, the, the laundry business. And then the second business that was very, very um, popular among the Chinese, and, and again, there's a reason for this, the Chinese going into the laundry business, in the restaurant business, and if you come all across Canada, all the small towns, major cities, laundries and restaurants. And it was a niche business because it was just something not too many other people wanted to do. It was There was a real demand for cleaning services, for food services. And the Chinese could go into their own business with very little startup capital, hire their own family and friends, and they could also live on the premises and save money again because most of these people who were living were men. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about the bachelor society. Um, but so the restaurants were the second business and there were two types, the ones that were outside of Chinatown and actually the first um, Chinese restaurant in Toronto was called Sing Tong Restaurant and it was at 37 and a half Queen Street, not far from here. And typically what you would have found in restaurants, Chinese restaurants outside of, of Chinatown would have served um, Western food so you could get a three course meal and all the bread you wanted to eat for about 15 cents, so really inexpensive uh, food. And the ones that were inside Chinatown, they would have been very small, catering mostly to the Chinese clientele, unless you were, say, one of the vaudeville actors from the nearby uh, theater district. And in fact, Edward G. Robinson loved going to the restaurant at 12 and a half Elizabeth Street, which would have been very close to here. Um, he said that was the best place to eat. So even back then, uh, Chinese restaurants, well, the ones in Chinatown for the Chinese clientele, and then with some exception, um, vaudeville actors and a few also 
ventured into Chinatown because in those early days, if you weren't Chinese, Chinatown had been heard about all the negative uh, perceptions that people had about going into the ward and then later into Chinatown. So by the early 1920s, um, the Chinatown was really quite thriving. It had the highest number of restaurants and laundries in its history. There were about 2,000 Chinese living in the city at that point in time. And it was the third largest Chinatown after Victoria and Vancouver. But what happened on July 1st, 1923, the D word was not development, but it was um, Dominion Day, because on July 1st, 1923, the government imposed the Chinese Immigration Act, uh, which virtually stopped all Chinese from coming into Canada. And Ellen made mention of the head tax. Well, this was a tax that was introduced in 1885 uh, at $50 imposed on the Chinese coming in, and that didn't seem to stop the, the inflow of Chinese, so that was doubled to $100, and then it was increased to $500 as a way to stop Chinese from coming into Canada. But that didn't seem to work as intended, so the government implemented this Chinese Immigration Act July 1st, which the Chinese, for many, many years, Dominion Day was not celebrated in Chinese communities. Rather, it was tr considered Humiliation Day um, because of, of this impact that it was gonna have on the community. There were very few exceptions. There were just a few students and diplomats that came in for the next 24 years. So what happened was, um, this bachelor society that started off when the head tax was, was introduced, you had all these men that were living in Toronto. Um, and at that time, the ratio of men to women was 12 to 1. Very, very few, of just about a dozen Chinese families in those early years. My mom, who was born in British Columbia, she came to Toronto um, in the 1930s, and her first really um, big memory she had was all these men that were um, just in Chinatown. And she said there were so few families then. And this really had an impact on her. And um, my, when she met my father, they were matched up by a matchmaker. And they got married in, the 19, in 1939. And I said to my dad, I said, Dad, you know, the ratio was 12 to 1. And you just lucked out. You got mom, one of the few women in Toronto at the time. And my dad, he had a great sense of humor. And he just said, well, there wasn't much toy choice at the time. <laughs> So the, this, this early Chinese community, what did, what did they rely on? They didn't have settlement services like we do today. So they went to their associations, and there were three major type of associations in Chinatown. There were family associations, so all the Wongs belonged to their Wong association. Um, my mom was a Wong before she got married, so she was very active there. And my, my father was a Lum, so there was a Lum association. And so the other, the second one would have been um, based on where you were born. Um, most of the early Chinese came from the south part of China, the province of Guangdong. And so these locality associations based on where, what village you were from or what county you were from. And then the third were the political associations. So the Chinese really relied on these associations um, not only to help them find a job, help them find a place to live, um, uh, help them with their legal issues, but a banking service was a really important part of these associations because in those early years, um, Chinese could not borrow money from the banks. So besides going to the associations for their social act activities, celebrating Chinese New Year and other festivals, what did they do? Um, well, in those early years, English, free English language classes were super, super popular because that was being offered by um, churches in, in, the, in the area. And of course, um, gambling, you would have found many gambling houses along Elizabeth Street and along Dundas Street. And then of course, Chinese, um, Cantonese opera and music, very, very popular. And um, there were three um, Cantonese opera clubs right in Chinatown. And they, they not only provided entertainment, but they also trained um, singers and, and opera performers. And I remember even as a kid growing up, going to the Casino Burlesque Theater, uh, it was on Sundays because when the theater was closed, the Chinese would rent the hall and that, that's where um, the performances would happen um, in the burlesque theater on Sundays. <laughs> but after, um, so the war happened and after World War II, things really started looking up for the Chinese. Um, it, perception started changing because of the contribution of Chinese Canadians, not only in the armed services, but also in their wartime relief efforts. And most importantly, the Chinese Immigration Act was repealed in 1947. But then this dreaded D word appeared once again, and two-thirds of Chinatown was expropriated and demolished for the construction of new city hall and the public square. 
But so what was left in the one third of the Chinatown? Um, what happened was that what we call the big four restaurants opened up. Um, Nanking Restaurant, Lychee Garden in the late, 50, uh, late 40s, and then later Sai Wu Restaurant and the Kuang Chow Restaurant. That was the restaurant that my parents um, owned. And they were really important in that these Chinese restaurants were so different from the earlier Chinese restaurants. They weren't these little small restaurants that case catered mostly to Chinese clientele. They were, that was the heyday of Chinese Canadian food. And they made Chinatown into a tourist attraction. They, they were destination points for people to come into Chinatown. And not only that, the, the owners of these big four restaurants were the leading uh, community um, members and they really helped to change the public and political perception of the Chinese in Toronto. So, but what happened when City Hall opened in 1964, five, that D word appeared again, and that was development, because there were, for what was left of Chinatown, there was further plans to do something on Elizabeth Street and Dundas Street. But this time, the Chinese community um, rallied and fought back, and it was the first time that they got involved in urban reform politics. And my mother headed up a group called Save Chinatown Committee, and they were very, um, they were successful in halting the further development at that point in time. And as a result of my mom's work um, in saving Chinatown and also her work in um, helping to change Canada's immigration laws, she was the first Chinese Canadian to receive the Order of Canada. So, <laughs> so I just want to conclude about the, the Chinese, uh, Chinese community and the history of, the, of our first Chinatown is that um, our Chinatown, if you go up to Elizabeth and Dundas now, it, it is a shadow of its past. Um, but it has left behind a legacy of these early entrepreneurs, their resilience and perseverance. And there were many stumbles and falls, um, but they have not been in vain because um, today we have 300,000 strong in the city of Toronto and half a million in the GTA, starting from one man, Sam Ching, in 1878. And even though First Chinatown is not the same, it is still the foundation and building block for not only our thriving Chinese community, but also our flourishing diverse city that we call home. Thank you. So I think we'll open it up for questions.